From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hey guys, uh, my name's Aaron. Feel free to use my voice on your podcast if you need to. I'm calling because I just heard one of you say, I forget who it was, one of you say um, something about meth being made domestically. Um, I was just calling because I think you guys were talking about the cartel. Um, I just wanted to let you know that it is actually, I guess the majority of it is produced by the cartel now. Um, and this used to be, I guess, privileged law enforcement information. But, um, yeah, the cartel is even using uh, Native American uh, reservations to help uh, traffic their products throughout the West because these reservations typically tend to be, uh, I guess, law enforcement presence there is much lower than elsewhere. Um, but, yeah, feel free to look into the issue. Thanks. One note, uh, meth is decriminalized, I believe, in some parts of the U.S., Oregon, at least, or Portland. Well, yeah, all drugs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, you know, and, and this is a, a a huge argument to be had in a whole another conversation for another day, like what happens when you um, prohibit the use and sale of uh, substances, you get situations like you have with the cartels swooping in and wreaking havoc uh, on populations such as uh, Native Americans because they're doing whatever they can to dodge law enforcement. Um, and, and this is very much true. It looks to be, uh, at least in the article that I found, which was a couple of years old, uh, about 90% of this was in 2017. So yeah, in 2017, around 90% of methamphetamine uh, that is, you know, circulated in the United States is manufactured across the border in Mexico by drug cartels. Yeah. And there's, there, there's something interesting that Aaron brings up here. Uh, we, I think we all noticed, we said, this may have formerly been privileged law enforcement information. Thank you. Thank you for clearing this up for us, because the more you think about it from the perspective of cartel leadership or management, I guess they have middle management, too, I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah. The, the more you think about it, the more it makes sense uh, for exactly the motivation you described, Noel, the the um, the the goal of avoiding law enforcement as much as possible for anyone not aware uh here in the u.s uncle sam recognizes the inherent rights of tribes as what are called domestic dependent nations tribal sovereignty we talked about this a little bit in the past i think how there are different legal systems in place on reservations uh so it is quite possible and i i I don't have this yet. I think we'd have to do a full episode on this to, to get all of the facts, but it is possible that uh, maybe some level of that local tribal enforcement could be compromised or could be bribed, you know? Well, it's one of these things too, where, I mean, again, not to paint with too broad a brush here, but it's one of these things where it's like, we give Native Americans that, that sovereignty that you described and that autonomy when it been, when it suits us. And then when right. it doesn't, we'll figure out a way to swoop in and take advantage of their land and their situation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm again, I, I know I'm generalizing there a little bit, but that does seem to be the attitude. And when it comes to actually protecting them or getting them, say, COVID vaccines or what have you, that's that's another story. Then it's like, hey, you're on your own. You, you, you wanted independence you know, have it. But um, there's a story I found in the Albuquerque Journal from 2017 talking about uh, two, a pair of brothers, uh, Luis uh, and Miguel Rangel Arque, um, 36 and 44 years old, who were working for the Sinaloa drug cartel and actually set up uh, a, a, a hub, a distribution hub, 
near Farmington uh, on a Navajo reservation there back in 2015, where they were selling meth uh, that they that was manufactured across the border by the Sinaloa cartel. Um, they rented a house there and they recruited um, people living on the Navajo reservation and also you know, others. But uh, the reason they targeted uh, the folks on the Navajo reservation was because of the exactly what we're talking about, that they had this kind of like almost off the books kind of situation where they weren't pr- perhaps not in the, the line of sight of uh, traditional law enforcement as much. Um, and this is something that they're being that they're capitalizing on. And not only for the distribution, I mean, we know for a fact that First Nation communities are often hotbeds for drug addiction and, and for alcoholism and for a lot of these in suicide uh, just because of the not by their own doing, but poor conditions and, and unemployment and uh, malnourishment and things like that, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the crushing uh, intergenerational effects of you know, centuries of persecution, right? I, I think that the bill comes due. To your point, Noel, there are a number of other factors too, right? We're talking about areas that are largely rural, right? It's easier to get away with things away from the spotlight. Uh, we're also talking about as messed up as it is to say, we're also talking about what some people would see as an economic opportunity, in a area that is in areas that are often deprived of economic opportunities. And to your point about convenience, we could go even further, right? Convenience and hypocrisy on the part of the U.S. government and say that uh, maybe there are officials uh, affiliated with Uncle Sam who have, for one reason or another, been able to turn a tacit blind eye. To, to this epidemic. And it seems very, I don't know about you guys, but it seems very much like an epidemic, wouldn't you say? It does. It really does. Ben, uh, off mic, you were talking about a stat that you ran across, um, which was a staggering percentage of violent crime associated specifically with the meth trade that happens on uh, First Nations lands. Yeah, yeah, you're right. This is, uh, this is pretty somber stuff. So, since the introduction of methamphetamine to these lands, uh, FBI offices located in what they refer to as Indian country, which is pretty much just a, it's a group name for all of these areas. They estimated that 40 to 50% of the violent crime cases they investigate involve methamphetamine. That can, mean, uh, that can mean one of two things. That could mean either uh, the alphabet guys are prioritizing investigating that, or it could just be a profoundly disturbing sense of the problem, right? Of the degree to which meth has infiltrated these communities. Man, can I, like, I, I just want to make a confession and I'm sorry, you guys, I've, I know a lot of people will dislike this when, when I, when I hear these kinds of stories and r- reporting on things like this, I feel so much like a narc or like a, I don't know, like a cop where like I, I want to, I want to take down people who are putting meth in anyone's hands. Like oh, that okay. is so just not, not the person doing the meth. My God, come on. That's like, Oh, uh, 100%. That's, some, that's someone 100%. who's being used, right, it, it, as a it, cash cow. It, it is someone who's, and that's why it's a tricky conversation because, like, on the, on the one hand, we're all adults and we can make our own choices, but it, it, a drug like that that is so incredibly addictive um, and it offers, like, an outlet or, or, like, a kind of an escape for folks that are maybe living a life that isn't uh, the life that they would have chosen, you know, for themselves, that is the opportunistic part. Uh, it's one yeah. thing for like, you know, yuppies in New York doing coke on boardroom tables or something like that. That's its own thing. Uh, this is very much a uh, predatory, you know, very, very, very predatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, Matt, I have to confess, when you were building up to saying that, when you're saying I'm saying I'm going to say something that a lot of people might have a problem <laughs> with. I swear to God, dude, I've known you for more than a decade. And I thought, is Matt about to say 
I love meth. I just <laughs> love it. I, I, My I wife wanna, and I do it together. I, it's I, just the best. I want to double. Ma- I want to double back really quickly though, too, and just to say what I just said about yuppies doing, you know, coke in New York City or whatever. That has because of prohibition of drugs a trail of bodies and uh, mm-hmm. that's associated with mm-hmm. it and, and a trail of, of of people taking advantage of people that are less fortunate along the supply chain of the cocaine trade and the cartels because the cartels yeah. are where that drug is coming from too so i say legalize it all get rid of the cartels yeah. People make their own choices and, 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 you know, but then again, are corporations any less targeting and insidious? Would the corporations say, oh, let's leave the First Nations people alone. No meth for them. Right. Yeah. No, they would say they are adults. They can make their own choices and they can. But this is different. This feels very uh, insidious. And I, I, again, I'm not sure where to even fall when it comes to something like meth or heroin. But I do know that the fact that it's illegal is what causes these situations. Were we seeing things about women being targeted mm, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. to traffic you know, in these uh, reservations? Yeah, we're, we're seeing that specifically with Native American women in certain certain areas, Cheyenne tribes. There, you, can, you can search for this thing uh, not on our land, and there, there's a title here, Tribes, Cartels, Luring Women to Traffic Meth. You can learn about the true human impact on the, you know, <clears throat> on that level as well. I mean, we've had other listeners write to us and call to us specifically talking about meth and families getting mm-hmm. caught up in trafficking meth. Um, like a, you know, a mother or a wife or a husband or somebody who just happens to be selling meth and now... That's their life. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, it's terrible. It's it's really terrible. Well, you know, uh, there there are so many things wrapped up in this. Uh, three things I'll say briefly. So I cannot be the only person listening to the show today who saw methamphetamine go through rural towns like a goddamn tornado. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a natural disaster. And uh, when we see that level of chaos and destruction, we have to ask who benefits, right? Because to to the point about legalization of all drugs, uh, whether you are for it, whether you are against it, whether you are somewhere on the spectrum of like decriminalization or something like that, there's no going around the fact There is a huge industry built entirely upon the war on drugs. And yes, some of these substances irreparably ruin lives beyond the point of no return. Uh, And then, you know, there is a profit motive for, for a lot of these things. There is a system that exists that profits off of drugs being illegal. And it doesn't just involve cartels, I would argue. Oh, we're talking about drugs that tore through rural communities. Let's talk about OxyContin and mm-hmm. things like that. A, a legal drug, quote unquote, manufactured by a massive corporation that profited hugely off of off of the misery of, of these people. And then, you know, got a little slap on the wrist and, and paid a fine. Um, but I remember a time uh, when things like, you know, OxyContin and Percocet and uh, Dilaudid and things like that that were very heavily regulated, no doubt, uh, painkillers, but just sweeping through those parts of the country and, and ruining whole lives and whole families' lives. Um, and those are legal drugs. So I just don't see the distinction. You know what I mean? Like, every, yeah. it's it's all uh, on an equal playing field of nasty to me, and you might as well just get rid of the part that actually, you know, decapitates their uh, competition or, mm-hmm. you know, like families that live in their wake and try to speak up against what they're doing. And I'm obviously referring to the cartels. Yeah. And that goes to the second point I want to make, which is, is chiefly about that distinction. So much of this goes into branding. There are definitely people, you know, who are currently on some form of amphetamine and it's just, it's not called meth. It's not quite the same thing, but remember Adderall contains amphetamine, and Adderall is a drug of choice for thousands of brilliant college students and college professors as well. The distinction, I don't know, it's like, remember the um, 
racist laws regarding prosecution for powder cocaine versus crack cocaine, mm-hmm. right? There was there was a systemic issue at play here. Uh, the the third the third point I would I would say that's salient in regard to this is that it's an ongoing thing that is not getting na- national coverage. Is it? I mean, I see Noel, you did a great job um, digging up some some of the the local journalistic work from Albuquerque and from and we we saw multiple other regional sources. But where is the national attention? You know what I mean. And how long are cartels going to get away with this? Like I I do think like honestly, if you wanted to depower the cartels, morals and ethics aside the best way to do it is to change the legal environment such that their endeavors are no longer profitable. You're 100% right. That's the easiest and probably the most effective way to do it. And it probably won't ever happen. I mean, maybe with marijuana. I think marijuana will be legal around the U.S. eventually, or at the very least, decriminalized. But I, 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 you know, I hope to see it in, in the next handful of years under this administration. I don't know. Because, uh, I mean, at least shift the money to be made to the right places or to places that we can actually benefit from, like infrastructure, you know, uh, road work, you know, what, what, what have you, things that actually benefit us as, as citizens, you know, tax that stuff and, and, uh, and put it to, put it to good use as opposed to it just literally disappearing across the border. <laughs> Colorado yeah. definitely made a great case for a lot of the political class when they made it legal to sell marijuana. Remember what happened? They made boatloads of money and they sold out a weed. Because everybody was going straight to Colorado and they walked off with a huge surplus. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there, that's what I'm saying. Like there are all kinds of uh, feel good statements that politicians and some business leaders will make regarding this situation. But ultimately, if you want to predict how things will most likely fall out, you have to start with the numbers. You have to start with the money, um, which is depressing. But it's yeah. true. I mean, Breaking Bad explored it as well. You want to know something else depressing? Uh, if you OD on an opioid, uh, not good. But there is that thing called, I think it's naloxone. Um, yeah, naloxone can revive you if you OD and someone discovers you and can get that drug to you. Narcan. That is, is it Narcan, Narcan? One of them? Narcan is one. Uh, nasal naloxone is mm-hmm. another, mm-hmm. Uh, which I think Narcan is like the the brand name of or whatever. But um, if you OD on meth, there's not much that can be done for you. If you fall asleep and go in, you know, to a coma and then just don't wake up. Um, It's pretty terrifying. And only at least in, as of in 2016, around 7,500 people died. That's an estimate of directly from methamphetamine uh, usage. So, you know, that's overall, that's not a lot. That's thousands of people. Um, just please be careful out there. Whoever you are, if you're listening to this, just be careful with any drugs like this. Because as as we're all saying here, you can find meth or accidentally take it because it can come in these little white pills that look like any other little white pill. And uh, just be careful. 